Hi. For the next, first lecture uh, in this course, I'd like to talk a little bit about the profession of audiology. I know traditionally a majority of you have uh, uh, are keen on pursuing a career in speech language pathology, but there might be a few who are still on the border, uh, on the wall, kind of, or deciding between audiology and speech language pathology. One of the hidden agendas uh, of this course and the portion that's covered by Dr. Fagelson earlier was kind of to entice you guys about this exciting field of audiology and kind of urge you guys to consider um, uh, pursuing or thinking about pursuing a career in audiology. As you all probably know, audiology um, is a, a one of the health professionals, uh, particularly uh, studying uh, the auditory and the vestibular system, uh, be test individuals to uh, for the for any hearing or balance disorders. And we are involved with the non-medical management of uh, hearing loss and uh, balance conditions. As an audiologist, uh, by virtue of your academic degree and clinical training and with licensure, uh, you would uh, be able to provide a comprehensive array of professional services, including identification, assessment, uh, the diagnosis, um, and uh, the non-medical management of individuals with hearing loss and uh, vestibular condition. The profession of audiology is actually um, it's quite young. Um, back in 1920s, um, it was a hearing aid manufacturers that actually manufactured um, audiometers as uh, as equipment to measure hearing. Robert West, um, who was a speech pathologist, and we owe it to the speech pathologist uh, for promoting uh, the need for a separate profession uh, to address individuals with uh, hearing concerns. However, audiologists existed uh, well, for a long, long time. You probably would uh, remember from those old Western movies. Uh, uh, usually, it's the baddie or, uh, or the bartender um, who was hearing impaired and wears a uh, an interesting-looking ear horn or a shell. Here are some examples of uh, hearing devices that have been used in the in the past. Uh, here is a Victorian era um, device, and here we've got uh, a classical looking ear trumpet. Some of these devices are still um, are there in some museums uh, that showed how um, a history has progressed into our present day, where we have uh, we have been benefited by those developments in technology, uh, and hand in hand, audiology has moved with technological advances. Now, with uh, with us being in the digital era, uh, we've seen a dramatic change um, in the technology of hearing aids and other assisted listening devices. Uh, but it's important to look at the past and see where we came from, our humble beginnings. Um, interestingly, you can see this is a, a chair that was used by the King John the Sixth, um, and this device actually the the speakers were required to kneel in front of those uh, handles of the chair uh, and speak into it uh, while the king was listening through a hidden well device that was plugged into his ears. So as I said, the field of audiology is quite young. It's probably about 65 years old at the most. And a big surge uh, into the interest uh, of audiology was following uh, the World War II, like many other professions in, uh, related to health. Prior to that, 
uh, hearing care was provided by uh, autologists or physicians and hearing aid dealers. Following the war, a large number of veterans uh, returned back uh, with significant hearing problems. And then there was this great need uh, to help these individuals. Um, and that kind of um, helped develop the field of audiology. Audiologists owe it to autologists, uh, who are the hearing physicians, our ear physicians um, and the speech language pathologist for developing techniques and uh, coming up with a program um, specific to audiology. The word audiology goes derives from um, Latin and Greek means it's a study of uh, uh, hearing. Uh, it's popularly held that the father of audiology is Raymond Carhart, who was a speech pathologist, and Norton Canfield. The past few decades especially, we've seen a dramatic uh, increase um, in the need for audiological services and the awareness of audiology. Now all 50 states and the District of Columbia require state licensure and uh, the education requirements have moved uh, towards a doctoral degree. Initially back in 1946 when the first uh, course was offered it was uh, for an undergraduate degree in health professions uh, back in Northwestern University by Raymond Carhart. Uh, since then they progressed to a specific undergraduate focus on audiology um, and until recently it was a master's uh, master's degree in audiology. But now um, a majority of the states require an entry level of a doctoral degree to practice audiology. To obtain an audiology license um, in most states um, you need to be uh, need to have completed a programmatic uh, course of study. Um, and have had about uh, more than 2,000 hours of clinical practicum and uh, cleared a praxis examination. The certification, also popularly known as a clinical competence certificate that's offered by ASHA, the American Speech Language Hearing Association, is not required uh, to practice audiology, but it kind of facilitates um, an audiologist moving from state to state. So again, the scope of practice for audiology uh, would be the identification of hearing loss, um, the differential diagnosis of different types of hearing loss um, through different test, test procedures, and we are involved with the non-medical management of those individuals suffering with uh, a hearing impairment and are having a vestibular balance condition. In order to kind of highlight the importance of a profession, health profession, it's important to um, to understand uh, um, the impact of this clinical condition um, in the population that we're going to be serving. So there's two important epidemi epidemiological measures. Uh, one would be prevalence which would be a measure of how many individuals are suffering with this clinical condition at any given point. And the second measure would be incidence. Uh, that would refer to the number of new cases uh, that occur uh, or suffer with this condition. There are about uh, 28 million individuals uh, within the United States suffering with what we consider as a significant hearing loss. That's about 10% um, of our national population. And however, this doesn't include um, some hearing and listening conditions like uh, a minimal hearing loss or an auditory processing disorder or hearing related conditions like tinnitus um, so yeah, as you can see, we're dealing um, with a large population uh, would benefit from audiological services. 
In this slide, I've given a link uh, at the bottom over here that kind of um, uh, will lead you into the Vanderbilt website to play a short video, um, a short funny video about hearing loss, um, how hearing loss can affect uh, an individual. A large majority of individuals suffering with hearing loss um, are, uh, are within the elderly population. And it refers to a specific type of hearing loss that we call as presbycusis. In this table, um, you can see some measures of um, prevalence of hearing loss and related disorders. Uh, of importance uh, to note is how there's a large uh, population with in the school-aged gr group um, that are likely to get uh, an ear infection. Almost about 90% of children within the United States have had at least one ear infection. Uh, and there's increasingly research that has shown that even if it's a recurrent minimal hearing loss, um, it might result in language and academic difficulties later on in these children. So again, this is a large group uh, of our population who would um, need audiological services. Here's a chart showing you how uh, the prevalence of hearing loss increases with age and with our aged baby boom population. We're talking about a large group of individuals um, presently suffering with hearing loss and who would need um, audiological services. As for the incidence of hearing loss, um, as I said, um, a vast majority of children um, are more likely to suffer with with a middle ear condition, uh, commonly known as otitis media. And there's about six out of thousand infants that are born with uh, a congenital hearing loss. So early identification and treatment is vital, uh, especially for these uh, children, to prevent any uh, future speech and language uh, delays or academic difficulties. Audiology um, has, has been ranked quite high and consistently high um, as, as a desired profession. As an audiologist, you can find an employment in uh, a very number of uh, settings. Predominantly, you would work in a medical setup, um, but there are audiologists serving in school systems and in industries. Um, um, they might be working in research and development in, um, in, in hearing aid companies or cochlear implant companies, or you might be working um, um, in an academic environment, um, training a future audiologist. Here are, again, two other links that's going to give you a little bit more information about uh, the profession of audiology and some facts about, um, the, uh, about the career in audiology. Again, these links will not work um, in the video version of this lecture you would have to open uh, the PowerPoint version of the lecture to, and uh, click on these hyperlinks to take you to these external websites. There are a number of subspecialties in audiology. Uh, one of them would be the medical audiology, and that's typically where a majority of, um, of audiologists find themselves employed. Uh, that might be working in, in hospitals or ENT offices or uh, with the Veteran Administration Medical Centers. Again, um, as a medical audiologist, you would be seeing patients of all ages. Um, you would be providing them with an array of um, diagnostic procedures. Um, and if identified to have a hearing loss, um, you would be involved with the management 
of uh, these individuals with hearing aids or with other technologies like cochlear implants or bone anchored hearing aids. A few of you might find yourself working in a school environment. Uh, here, your role would be to screen and identify individuals with hearing loss. Um, you would be referring them for follow-up services. And in this setting, you would work quite closely with, uh, with the teachers, special educators, with the parents, of course, uh, and the child. Uh, another increasing role of uh, an educational audiologist is to create awareness of noise-induced hearing loss. Um, of late, there's been a number of reports about the increasing, alarming increase in the number of uh, school-age children having hearing loss uh, consequent to listening to the personal audio systems. Um, so our, our, one of your roles would be to improve awareness about noise-induced hearing loss uh, and, um, and provide um, yeah, well, education to parents and the children regarding the ill effects of uh, this noise-induced hearing loss. Uh, further down in this course, um, actually, we'll talk a little bit more about noise-induced hearing loss. And uh, one of your assignments, actually, would be to create a pamphlet um, to um, pamphlet talking about uh, noise-induced hearing loss and uh, increasing awareness uh, in school-age children about this uh, condition. A few audiologists might prefer working in a specific pediatric setting. Uh, this could be a pediatric hospital or a pediatric-focused ENT clinic. Um, here, you, the population primarily you'll be dealing with would be the children and the parents of the children with hearing loss. A large number of uh, audiologists um, seem to be moving towards um, opening their own private setup. Um, they're enticed by the autonomy um, that this clinic provides. Uh, and uh, you would uh, see patients from, from different referrals, uh, but you would run your own clinic. In fact, uh, a number of recent graduates also have preferred to take that route, and um, and it's one of the growing um, kind of subspecialities in audiology uh, that's promoted by a number of our associations uh, right now. Well, if somebody was to consult me, I would always um, recommend that a recent graduate um, seeks employment in another private practice to kind of learn more about the business aspects of audiology, which is a whole different ball game uh, prior to opening their own uh, practice. But that's where the largest growth is, and it's uh, economically and it's quite satisfying is what I hear. A few audiologists might specifically work uh, within the industry, um, and these might be industries where workers might be exposed to hazardous noise levels. Uh, and noise-induced hearing loss uh, is the number one uh, occupational um, disease. Um, it still remains the number one occupational disease. So as an industrial audiologist, your role would be to create um, hearing conservation programs, periodically assess workers working in these noisy environments, and recommend hearing protection devices, and non-medical management if they are uh, found to suffer already with a hearing loss. Um, in this setup, you might uh, be testifying in legal proceedings uh, for worker injury and disability compensation. So you'll be working with physicians, attorneys, uh, safety engineers, and uh, might have to deal with um, industry unions. So these are some subspecialties in audiology. As far as academic preparation, as I, um, I just told you, um, that we've progressed from an undergraduate to a graduate to actually a doctoral entry-level uh, degree uh, to practice audiology. 
the doctoral level can be a PhD or a clinical doctorate or an AUD degree. Um, and as I said, there's a, a preset curriculum that you need to have had uh, in college and uh, um, a large number of clinical supervised hours uh, before you can take your praxis examination and get a license to practice audiology. And some have asked me in, uh, in the past uh, what's the difference between the clinical doctorate degree and uh, a research PhD in audiology. Uh, as you probably know, the PhD uh, focuses on um, on research, um, so you might have a curriculum um, of clinical audiology, uh, but there is a large focus on research too. And typically, those with PhD employed in academic or industrial settings, especially in research and development um, um, focus. With a clinical AUD degree, uh, you might become independent clinicians or supervisors in clinical practices um, in hospitals or in private clinics. The AUD program typically is four years post-bachelorate and most programs have the last year which would be an externship uh, where the majority of the time you are actually practicing or, or doing um, audiological testing. Um, just to give you a, a background uh, about my training, um, I was actually graduated with a master's in both uh, speech and hearing. So I was actually licensed to do speech language pathology and audiology, uh, but chose to do my PhD uh, in audiology. Uh, and that was a case in uh, and still might be the case in many uh, other countries outside the United States uh, where you're dual certified in speech language pathology and audiology. And that kind of also stresses the importance of uh, how interlinked our professions are, um, speech language pathology and audiology. Uh, our parent uh, national association, an American Speech Language Association, of course, addresses both speech language pathologist and audiologist. And uh, wherever you find yourself working as an audiologist, uh, you would be working close with speech language pathologist, especially if your focus is, uh, is with the pediatric population. Just to give you an idea, a little bit of information for different uh, professional societies. Again, our governing body would be the American Speech Language Hearing Association which has existed uh, for a long time. And it is a large uh, group. Uh, and um, one of the largest meetings that um, well, you can see around the country is our ASHA um, annual meeting um, held towards the end of the, the winter, um, where we can have as many as 12 to 13,000 participants. So it's a large gathering. There are other uh, professional societies, including the American Academy of Audiology, Auditory Society, and those specific to subspecialties like rehabilitative audiology, dispensing audiologist, and those working in the educational setting. As an audiologist, um, you're quite comfortable economically. Um, the, we have a decent entry-level salary and, um, and, and the incentives um, are, quite, um, are quite good. Um, since 2012, now it's become the entry-level as a doctoral degree. So, um, of course, the annual income in average um, is, is uh, it's quite comfortable uh, wherever you might find yourself working. And um, even with recent trends, um, as is the case with many health professions, audiologist is still um, is anticipated to be uh, a very desirable um, profession. And there's a lot of job opportunities out there. Uh, and I'd be very surprised to find an audiologist 
um, not finding a job or being unemployed for even for a short while. This slide is just a review um, of the topics that just we've covered. Uh, henceforth, we're going to be talking more about specifics and audio acoustics, uh, and then progress to lectures in anatomy, physiology, and um, actually hearing assessment. <clears throat>